Welcome to the Welcome Back uh, History Series. We're delighted that all of you are here today, and so we'll have a, a wonderful opportunity. A special thank you to the First Bank of Alabama for sponsoring this series, and we just are thrilled that that is going on. I may have to start over, but uh, don't worry about that. We can do it. If you will, go ahead and turn off your cell phones and get ready for what I consider one of the greatest presentations that we've had in some time. So if you will uh, just listen to me just for a second there, we're really looking forward to this program because, you know, the documentary on Muscle Shoals is already out and we've heard the music of the Swampers. So we're really looking forward to this. And we've got uh, Judy and Debbie who will tell us about the famous studio and how it was restored to its lost glory and especially the music of the Slumpers. Judy is the wife of the Slumper bassist, David Hood, and she is also chairman of the Muscle Shoals Music Foundation. She has a brilliant marketing and communication career that spans three or four decades. And she has with her Debbie Wilson, who is the executive director of the Muscle Shoals Music Foundation, and she has an amazing career. She's been from Maine to Spain, two county fairs and a goat roping. And in all of that, she has worked in tourism, uh, worked on state parks, on television, x-rays, and sometime uh, filming. So let's welcome the two important women, Judy and Debbie from the Muscle Shoals Foundation. They Oh, you're just going to show them? Oh. <laughs> well, she's going to show the... Yeah, Sarah's yeah. going to show the video. Yeah. Village on the Alabama border. Why does that music come out of that? Each time a person went to muscle shows, they came out of there with a hit. Record making like that doesn't happen often. It usually takes somebody like Rick Hall with the drive to do it. I was going to kick some ass and take some names. I wanted to be somebody. Rick Hall had a rhythm section of exceptional players. This guy would sit there in that studio and just fire the group, you know? And I'd be right there with him, singing along, and we'd all work it out together. Rick Hall is stuck there every minute. You gotta have a name. Um, Swampers is a good nickname. You just didn't expect them to be as funky or as greasy as they were. R-E-S-B-C-T, I know what it means to me. Paul Simon called Stax Records, talked to Al Bell, and said, hey, man, I want those same black players that played on I'll Take You There. He says, that can happen, but these guys are mighty pale. We started to explode. The world was coming to Muscle Show. When I think back on all the trap I learned in high school. You thought you had to find a good girl. I love the old man, sweetheart. Being there does inspire you to do it differently. It's like when they're coming up, you're shit up. It was been funky, you know, that was the whole idea there. <laughs> tell him of this great new deal we've made with Capital. One of the guys stopped me and said, we've already made a deal with Jerry, we'll be leaving here. It was war. You're going to hear some of the greatest voices that ever were. There are certain places where there is a field of energy. Well, your friend, security is really smart. 
on the new Nest Cams and Doorbell. Oh, how is Aretha doing? Well, I know what I am. The floor ain't no crying. And you shouldn't do it just because somebody wants you to. Town in North Alabama. What's most important is that you are treated with dignity God, and respect. What I mean. Ain't nobody worried. You have a talent. Big ball. Ain't no silly. Think about it. Try to do it. How are you to the races? The voice is going on the third, honey. Thank you. We had several great musicians on the show. When we all started, we kind of started this. It's really good. I got a single by this new chick named Aretha Franklin. This song goes out to the morning to anyone who's ever felt the street. I used to see that messed up a little there on there. It's rock and roll. It's not meant to be perfect. Yes, it's rock and roll. So how is everybody? Yeah, how's everybody doing? This is a beautiful facility. We appreciate y'all having us here today. This is really nice. Um, so uh, I'm Judy Hood, and this is Debbie Wilson, and we're going to tell you a little bit about the magic that we have, have had going on in Muscle Shoals for since W.C. Handy, frankly. But um, we like to have, – have any of you seen the Muscle Shoals documentary? Have any of you seen the film? Great. Then you kind of know, you know, what all the fuss is about, the uh, – the, the documentary uh, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in January of 2013, and it rocked our world in the best possible way in Muscle Shoals because our music has always been heard around the world, and it's always been very viable. But there was a period of time after disco and you know, when things slowed down a little bit, and it wasn't quite as vibrant in terms of the message getting around the world. But the documentary changed all that and reignited that spark um, that made us the hit recording capital of the world. So for the past, um, my plan when I was 55 was to retire from International Paper Company. I worked in marketing and communications. And I was retired about six months when the documentary came out. And all of a sudden, my uh, plans changed dramatically. The universe had a whole other thought. Actually, it was Lee Sintel's fault. We were talking about him earlier. Um, he wanted me then to be the boots on the ground and tell the story of Muscle Shoals and the documentary uh, all around the world with him uh, because my husband is David Hood, who is one of the Swampers. Um, you've heard the song, Sweet Home Alabama. There's a line in there that says, Muscle Shoals has got the Swampers. Well, what are Swampers? The Swampers were four studio musicians who played on literally hundreds of hit records uh, in Muscle Shoals. And it's funny, no matter where we go in other countries, people know that song. I mean, they know that song. And, and uh, I've heard it sung in a lot of different languages, but people know that song. So, Debbie, what did you have to add? Yeah, um, a lot of our business is international business. Um, at the studio, and we've traveled um, a lot together, and they know Sweet Home Alabama, and they also, sorry for all you Auburn fans, but they know um, uh, Roll Tide more than War Eagle. <laughs> Just <laughs> saying. And they, 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 we find this true in our studies. We well, and the, and the two things that, you know, uh, we, we uh, promote in, is music and football in Alabama. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the, the documentary um, has revived Muscle Shoals music. Our studio is an active recording studio at 3614 Jackson Highway, and it's also a um, tourist attraction during the day. 
And we've had, what is it, 40, uh, 80,000 80, visitors? 82,000 visitors from 40 different countries come and just want to stand Amazing. in those spaces where, you know, where the stones recorded wild horses mm -hmm. and where Rod Stewart and Bob Seeger and, you know, all these Because if you've seen the documentary and even the, the trailer, I mean, uh, the producer of the of the documentary, Stephen Badger managed to get interviews with Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Aretha, Aretha Franklin, and, and that was it took him three years to do yeah. the documentary. So, um, and of course, David and Judy was a huge part of that documentary. A lot of it was filmed at their house, uh, all over the area, and uh, we didn't know until the end of it really, until it debuted at Sundance. Yeah. We didn't know where they, they were headed have. with it. We yeah. we really didn't know. They worked on it uh, in Muscle Shows for three years, and my husband and his partners had been involved and Rick Hall had been involved, but we did not know exactly what it was going to look like or what the major focus was going to be because when we heard they had interviewed Aretha Franklin and Mick Jagger and Bono and, you know, uh, all these great big stars, then we thought, well, then we'll be a small part of that, you know. But um, it turned out to be about, you know, Rick Hall and the Swampers, and we were thrilled um, we, uh, David and I were in the audience at Sundance that day that it debuted, and again, we didn't know what to expect, and we were amazed at the quality. Of course, they hired the cinematographer who did Avatar to film it, and it shows, you know, you can see uh, the uh, cinematography is stunning. Uh, that's why, one of the reasons why state tourism took such a big interest in the film is because Aside from being a great story about our music, it was also a 90-minute commercial <laughs> for the state of Alabama because the um, the cinematography was so compelling. So, uh, we, so again, we didn't know what to expect. We were very pre pleasantly surprised. I knew, sitting in that audience that day, that things were not going to be the same in Muscle Shoals, um, that people would want to come from all over the world. And so we immediately, you know, got to work on tourism plans because we knew that was going to going to bust wide open. And one of the first things we did was purchase this building. It was privately owned by an individual who did not open it for tours. And so we formed a foundation and managed to purchase the physical structure, but it was in horrible condition. We basically had a fixer up or with no money to fix her up. And so we were wringing our hands and what are we going to do? Capital campaign, all that stuff you worry about when you need to raise money. Uh, because it wasn't even safe to walk into the building. And uh, <clears throat> three months from the day that we bought the studio, Dr. Dre of Beats Electronics saw the Muscle Shows documentary in a tiny little theater in Santa Monica, California. And he had been a fan of Muscle Shows music, but he did not know all those backstories. And he's a rags to riches guy himself. So he was so captivated by the film that he decided that night on the spot to start a philanthropic wing of Beats Electronics and call it Sustain the Sound. And the mission of, the doc, of, the, of that philanthropy would be to take iconic studios like ours and return them to their original glory. So basically a miracle. Uh, that was a Tuesday. On um, Thursday, he had his chief financial officer fly into the Muscle Shows Airport to talk to us about what that money transfer would look like. And he didn't just give us his money, he gave us his heart because he sent, on top of the money, he sent in the best acousticians in the world. He brought in interior designers because our plan was to restore it exactly as it was from 1969 to 1978, which is when the Swampers were in this building. And we managed to do that. We got it authentically restored right down to ugly orange carpet. Ugly. That they don't make anymore. And there's a reason why they don't make it anymore. <clears throat> but it was important to have it if we were going to replicate what went on there. So Beats Electronics actually sent their interior designers out to find that carpet. And they wound up having to make some carpet. <clears throat> so when you walk into the studio, you're seeing exactly what it looked like in 1969 and 1978. We opened um, for tours in um, 2014. And as I said, since then, we've had 84,000 people from 40 different countries. And about 28% of our visitors are not from the United States, to give you some idea of the international impact uh, this music made on the world. And of course, COVID turned us all upside down, you know, like everybody all over the world. 
and we're getting our domestic tourism back now, but you know, of course our international tourism, it's still difficult for people to fly, um, but that will change and they will come back. Um, We've got some books for the spring and Judy and I are doing an international show instead of Alabama sponsoring a big Muscle Shoals section of it uh, around the Aretha Franklin movie in the end of November. And we're gonna meet with about 40 tour operators. From around uh, the world. From around the world, so it's international. Because when they come, they stay longer and they spend three times more money. So for a nonprofit, our number one revenue source is merch. And then the tours and then recording. Yeah, um, That's our business model. So we love those internationals. Yes, we, we do. We want them to come back. And our, our, our foundation's mission is at odds with itself because uh, our mission is to celebrate the legacy of what happened there, but it's also to sustain the sound and keep that dream alive. So that's totally opposite missions because uh, we feel compelled to share the story because of those 84,000 people. And, but you can't do that and have a recording session going on. So what we do is we do our recording at night because I've had people come to me that were touring there uh, from Australia and Japan and all these places and they would tell me that they had saved up for two years just to get a plane ticket, Bucket just list. just just to come stand in that room. And so I don't want to be standing at the door of the studio when one of those people comes and go, oh, it's a bad day. We got a recording session, you know. So we do our recording primarily at night. And we don't do a lot of recording, but what we do, uh, we do at night. And the people who record there, the artists, are very reverent about that because they they want to celebrate what happened in that room and they want us to tell the story, you know, because they, they love it there too. And sometimes they'll come help us tell the story if we have visitors. So, um, so that's how we kind of managed, you know, both ends of, of our um, mission. Um, one thing I do want to mention, it may seem a little weird that we brought the movie Respect into this mix, but have any of y'all seen that yet? It just came out in theaters um, around the country and it's the story of Aretha Franklin. A uh, primary piece of the movie is how she found her voice in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Before she came to Muscle Shoals, she was signed to Capitol Records, and it was terrible. They had her in prom dresses, singing these sissy songs. I mean, you look, look, Google it, and you'll see these. I mean, Queen of Soul in a prom dress singing a sissy song. It's just wrong. So. Uh, so Jerry Wexler, who was the vice president of Atlantic Records and a very good friend and mentor to the Swampers, had his eye on her. And he thought, you know, her career's going down here fast, but this woman's got talent. And when Capitol Records decides they don't want her anymore, I'm scooping her up. So when her uh, contract with it, with Capitol was over, Jerry Wexler um, signed her immediately to Atlantic Records, which he was vice president of. And the first thing he did was bring her to Muscle Shoals because he wanted to get her in the same room with the Swampers. He knew if he could get her in Muscle Shoals and feel that soul that she would, be, and she will tell you, I mean, she, may she rest in peace, but throughout her life in interviews, she would tell you that she found her voice in Muscle Shoals because Jerry Wexler put her in a room with the musicians so she could feel the chemistry and the love and everything that goes with making music. And he sat her down at the piano in the room with the musicians and she hadn't been there but a couple of hours and recorded her biggest hit, which was I Never Loved a Man. And um, that scene plays, you know, plays pretty heavily into the Respect movie because it was such a pivotal point in her life. Um, interestingly enough, my husband's played on, you know, bass parts on so many hit records. That particular day, he played trombone. <laughs> it was earlier in his career and he played trombone. Um, and in the in the Respect movie, uh, which they allowed us to go and see him tape the uh, fame scene in Atlanta because they wanted my husband's input and his partner's input on is this accurate, is this how it should look? And, and they did make a couple of changes. But it's so funny to be on a movie set, which I'd never been on. I don't hang out on movie sets, but it was amazing to be there and see these young guys portraying, you know, David and Spooner and Rick Hall and... And the guy who um, portrays Rick Hall is from Russellville, Alabama, which I was so relieved because I didn't have to put up with a fake Southern accent. There's nothing worse real. than a fake Southern accent. This guy's accent is a real deal. He's from Franklin County, Alabama. And uh, 
we became fast friends and he lives in Hollywood now, but because he was born in Russellville and managed to make it to Hollywood to be in movies, he came from a lower middle class family, you know, no real, I mean, no opportunities really in, in for him to be in theater, but he had a theater teacher who really believed in him and got him auditions, helped him get a college scholarship. So he's coming back to Muscle Shoals in December to do a screenplay that he has written and he's going to film it there and he's going to use some of our students, our especially disadvantaged students in some of our rural schools and let them be in a screenplay and show them what it's like and, and tell them, you can get from Russellville, Alabama to Hollywood. Here was my address in Russellville. Here's my current address, you know, and believe in your dreams. So I really appreciate that because he didn't have to do that, you know, well, and, and he... It, it falls in line with the magic of Muscle Shoals music. Okay? Yeah, it really does. Because a lot of things had to happen for the documentary and then respect. And, you know, and uh, Judy's going to talk in a minute about the one we're called the Singing River. But there there was magic in the water. And, of course, her husband likes to say, well, it wasn't just magic. There was a lot of talent. <laughs> and that's <laughs> hard true. Work, there was yeah. a lot of hard work and a lot of talent, especially a lot of hard work. But the thing with, with uh, Stephen Badger, who's a producer of... Of Muscle Shell's documentary was on a random trip, just happened upon us in, in a muscle car, driving it across country with a friend. And then, like she said, Dr. Dre came along. And then this latest uh, Respect movie has given us another boost. And we thought the life of the Muscle Shell's documentary would be Lisa a year at the most. and I sat down and made a strategic plan right after the film came out. And we said, okay, we need to do this in six months. We need to do this in 12 months. And let's face it, by 18 to months to two years, it will have hit its high water mark. We'll move on to something else. We're not even at the high water mark. Thanks to streaming. People are still coming in from all over the world going, I'm here because of the documentary. And the, and the movie is still streamed right now. It's on um, Comcast platforms, Tubi, and of course, uh, it's on YouTube. A lot of different platforms, and that has made all the difference, especially in the international market and even the domestic market because, you know, they'd have to buy it in the early days or whatever, and now you can stream it. So, that has given it a second life, and then the Respect movie's given us another boost yeah, this year. that was another big shot in the arm, because now people want to come see the studios, you know, where Aretha worked, too. But I do want Judy to tell you how she almost I'm ruined the whole thing. I'm not telling the story. No, you have to. I'm telling the story. She almost ruined the whole Muscle Shells documentary I by her choice to. of candy I didn't at mean to. I didn't mean to. Um, Stephen Badger is the producer for the film, and we didn't realize who he was exactly. We just knew he was a guy who had come into town with a lot of passion for doing a documentary about Muscle Shoals. And we were careful because I've been married to David 35 years and you wouldn't believe how many times we're like, oh, I'm going to do the documentary on Muscle Shoals. This is going to be great. And then they disappear. So, but Stephen seemed to have some staying power and he did go out and hire the cinematographer from, from Avatar. Everything seemed to be doing done first class and they filmed some of the scenes from my house because we live out on the water on the lake and water figures heavily into the message of the singing river and but I didn't really know him I mean he would be in town like four weeks and then he'd be gone you know five and then he'd be back and I didn't know who he was he was just this laid-back guy would come in my house drink my cheap wine and eat my Hershey's candy and it was all good until my friend called one day and said do you know the guy that's been come into your house about this movie. And I said, well, I mean, I know who he is, you know. And she said, well, I think you better Google him. And so, you know, this is the music business we're in. So I figured it was a serial killer because you can count on wackos, you know, being everywhere. But, but I Googled him and it was Stephen Badger, CEO, Mars Candy Company. <laughs> and I'm like, this can't be, you know, this young. And no, it was. And so... Guess who'd been eating Hershey's Kisses at the Hood Mansion for? She almost... I about died. So I immediately got those out of there, placed it with Mars products, M&Ms everywhere. And, the, and I decided I was going to have the conversation with him in person. This isn't a conversation you have over the phone. So the next time he was at my house, we drank the same cheap wine. And uh, candy was different. Um, but I said, Stephen, what do you do for a living? I mean, you know what I do. And clearly, you know what David does. You're doing this documentary. But what do you do when you're not here? You know, you'll be gone for fun. And he just kind of stared at me. And, and I wouldn't shut up, you know. And, and, and I said, you know, and you didn't tell so many things about yourself. Like, you didn't tell us you're a gazillionaire, you know. Like, his mother's heir to, like, $40 billion in the market. And he kind of got red and was like, okay, I'm busted. He said, but... 
Judy, do not tell people this. I don't want people to know this. If my family's name gets involved, this becomes the Mars movie. And this is my gift to Muscle Shoals, and I want this to be the Muscle Shoals movie. And that's the kind of person Stephen is. Because his last name being Badger, we didn't pick up on it. His mother is Mars, and she's the heir to the fortune. But this was something Stephen wanted to do for himself and for Muscle Shoals. But it did explain why they were able to get Mick Jagger to talk to him. And, you know, and buy the it, rights to the songs to yeah, use in the movie. Yeah, you know. it, it did explain you know, a lot. But that's just the kind of person he is. And he's still on our foundation board and stays active. I mean, somebody's in and out of your life for three years doing a movie, you become, it became like family, you know, to, to all the musicians in most shows. One thing I want to point out is the size of this building. Uh, it's tiny. It's a little concrete block building. And uh, people are shocked when they come to see the studio. They're expecting to see Abbey Road or RCA Studio A or something big because they can't imagine that the Stones and Rod Stewart and Bob Dylan and, you know, all these people would have come there. And I think that's part of the magic and beauty of the story is that four young men with very little money but a very big dream took this tiny, shabby little, even restored it, still just a tiny little concrete block building, and turned it into one of the most influential recording studios in the world. I mean, it's so small, they don't even have a way to listen to playbacks. They had to walk out on the porch to listen to playbacks. We have an area called the listening porch, and we have pictures of Mick Jagger listening to playbacks to Wild Horses. I mean, that's, it's, it's definitely not the amenities. It was definitely the talent and the passion. And that's probably the, you see the surprise on their faces. It's because they can't believe. And we have a lot of people, a lot of grown men break down and cry on me, you know, when I tour them. You feel it in the room. Yeah, you feel the vibe. I really, um, especially our control, I, you can't have that much talent in a room that small over such a long period of time and such magical hits coming out of there without there being some residual mojo. And I just believe that. And so people feel that vibe. You know, well, and it was four young guys that did a lot of DIY. Yeah. Um, I mean, they didn't have a lot of money when they went in. Jerry Wexler was kind of bankrolling in the first couple of years. And so they put burlap, colored burlap on the ceiling. That was their sound treatment. It's burlap. And then they put, they got these foam things that electric meters used to come in from the utility department for free and place those on there. We now use them for toilet paper in the bathroom downstairs. Because they're perfect size to hold roll of toilet. But anyway, uh, but they did that and uh, like it was just four four guys in their twenties, and that was their idea of, of how to put it together. And we've restored it, it exactly as they had it. It's all about the den of debauchery. And the yeah, David didn't let me talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> downstairs, which was when COVID before COVID, all our tours started downstairs, and we would show them. Uh, the basement area where people would hang out, you know, between songs and what used to be the publishing offices and where David's old office was and all that. But when they were, two things to think about that are important to me. One is, this was, when they were in this building, it was 1969 and 1978. Now that was still the 60s in Alabama. We in North Alabama did not have the racial tension that they had in Selma and Montgomery and, you know, but there it was still the 60s in Alabama, and we had a ways to go on civil rights. The music that they played in that room, they didn't realize it at the time, but much of it was moving the, the, the civil rights needle in the right direction. And if my husband was here today with me, he would tell you that's what he's proudest of. And they didn't even know what they were doing. They just loved their black musician friends and and and... They were their brothers and sisters, and they were just making joyous music together with no other intention. And Mavis Staples recorded I'll Take You There in that building. She recorded Respect Yourself in that building. And that became, those became anthems for the civil rights movement. I mean, Dr. King had the Staples singers at his rally singing those songs. And that is just a beautiful unintended consequence of what they were doing in there. The other thing that was going on between 1969 and 1978 is it was a dry county. And people like Bob Dylan and Mick Jagger and 
Steve Wynn would, they like the occasional drink, you know, on top of probably other things. And um, so they weren't sure what to do about that because it was illegal. I mean, of course, the bootleggers were getting filthy rich, but they, um, but technically it was illegal. And the Swampers didn't want any trouble. They were opening their first studio. They wanted to play by the rules. So downstairs at the studio, there was paneling all along the wall downstairs. That ugly, ugly paneling, like in the 70s, the real dark, ugly, ugly with the orange carpet. And so there they had, so what they did is they made a false door behind the paneling. Mm -hmm. Did one of these numbers, you know, to make it open. And they made a secret room. And, and it's, it was like their little speakeasy. So they would have their gophers go up to the state line and bring back kegs of beer and whiskey or whatever. And that's where they would hang out. If y'all have ever been around a recording session, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. And that was also a place where somebody like Mick Jagger or Rod Stewart could hide out. Nobody would know they were there because just by looking, you didn't know there was a room back there. Visitors love that too. Yeah, they do. And, and I, we still I use it. yeah, Sessions. we do. Yeah. And to drink in, yeah. let's just tell the truth. Let's just call it what it is. Um, but uh, I like to call it the den of debauchery because <laughs> I'm just pretty sure some a lot of like, deals went down. Yeah, it's, yeah, of all Other kinds. Things. But. Uh, and it was pre, I was married to David then, so that's cool. Whatever happened, happened, you know, as long as it was pre-Judy, I'm good. Uh, but David doesn't like me to call it that, but I don't like to lie. And I'm pretty sure it was a den of debauchery. But if um, if y'all come to the studio, we'll, we'll, show, we'll take you into their little speakeasy secret room. And, uh, but people get a kick out of that because it's also a side of recording. You know, you, you see people in the studio, but there's a whole, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of, hurry up and wait something has to happen you know in between and so we do start our tours down there now and we've taken a little bit of poetic license um with some of the furniture stuff just because we needed room uh right, to start an area you know to introduce people to the tour and we've built outside restrooms which is one of the things we yeah we we're proud right of those. That. yeah uh we're one of the few um, museums are like, look, we have these bathrooms and they're yeah. hidden in their air. Yeah, I always want to that. tour people through the bathrooms. I'm so proud yeah. of this. But, uh, but anyway, the what strikes people, I think, the most is how in the world Rod Stewart and Paul Simon, Bob Seger could record it anywhere in the world and they came there, you know? So, you know, it was not the amenities. It and was, Cher was the first artist, big artist, to really record there, and Jerry Wexler got her there. And before that, it didn't have the 3614 Jackson Highway, which is actually the address of where we're at in Sheffield. And even though it's Muscle Shell Sound, we're actually in Sheffield. So that confuses a lot of people and a lot of GPS yeah. when people do it. But um, after she recorded there, she named, uh, she was there, was right, not long before her and Sonny Bodo. Right. He was thing. with her, and there's a, lots of really good pictures of them in the front. He was on a Bama shirt. He was a big... Um, Bear Bryant fan, but he also was very annoying, apparently. So much so, they threw him out of the control room. Yeah. So on the album, he, which he ended up naming 3614 Jackson Highway, and had that look on the, on the, um, of the sign, the blue, it's blue and white. And the Swampers liked it so much, they ended up doing that. But they threw him out of the session, and on the album, his credit is a spiritual advisor. Yeah, so he did get on the he album. He did get a credit on that. But he tried to tell Jerry, this was, and I can kind of understand where he was coming from. You know, they, they had always worked together. This was the first solo project for her, and he just couldn't keep his hands off of it. And he would try to tell Jerry Wexler what to do. Well, nobody told Jerry Wexler what to do, and he found that out, you know, pretty fast, and got excused from the premises, but then he did wind up listed as a spiritual advisor. So I'm glad he got some props. But when they saw that album cover, in the front of the studio was empty, no signs. And they had uh, a sign made just like the one on the album cover. And it's been there ever since. So, One of our uh, board members is also Dave Cobb, who is um, produces Jason Isbell, Reba McIntyre, Brandy Carlisle, uh, Chris Stapleton. And he brought Chris Stapleton to us. So we're an active recording studio still about a year and a half ago, almost two years now. And we had to clear out the studio. I mean, when you have someone that big and was all, we had to be very secretive about it. And um, it's on his latest album, which the, the cut on the album is called Cold, and it turned out amazing. But he came there to do more songs, but he gets there, and his wife's like eight or nine months pregnant. months pregnant. Yeah, I mean, she, I was, she was 11 months pregnant. Well, they decide they would go out. She wanted to eat at this specific restaurant. It was like, well then you're not going to be a secret anymore because yeah. Chris Stapleton's very, has a very distinct look and so it wasn't. But then he gets back the next day and he has laryngitis. 
So, so yes, yeah, so they left, but uh, he, he, they have that amazing but song while on there. While he was there, he cut that song, Cold, which, which is, is an amazing. amazing song. And and, uh, and another and, group, we've had three Grammy nominations, mm -hmm. a group called Rival Sun. So we're Grammy-nominated uh, and very active on the charts kind of studio again, which makes David very happy because we're trying to sustain that sound as well yeah. as honor the legacy. We, we have students from the University of North Alabama that our tour guides and that help us with a lot of things because that's the future and having these recording sessions continue um, is very important to us and also outreach like we're doing today in different things. Because we want to nurture an environment where young people can stay in Muscle Shells to do their craft, you know, like the Swampers got to do because, um, you know, it's, at one point there just weren't that many opportunities for younger people. So we're trying to nurture that. And of course, David and some of his colleagues have mentored, you know, the young people in our area. And we just want to give them an environment where if you want to go test your wings and move to New York or somewhere for some period of time, that's fine. But we want it to be because you want to, not because you have to. And uh, I'm going to, I'll tell you a quick, um, a little quick info about the Singing River because the Native Americans who settled in our area believed that there was a woman in the river there who sang to them and that the songs that she sang protected them. So they called our waters the Singing River. And uh, when the Trail of Tears, you know, happened, um, they were, of course, removed from Muscle Shoals area out to Oklahoma, and there was one particular woman who couldn't stand it. She got out there, and she couldn't hear the river singing, and she didn't feel safe, and so she walked back from Oklahoma. She walked all the way out and walked all the way back. Her great-grandson built a tribute to her called Tom's Wall, and he it's the largest man-made wall in, the, in America, and he has a rock in that wall for every step she took going to Oklahoma, and every step she took coming home. And it took her three years to walk home. So a lot of uh, theories are that, because people go, why Muscle Shoals? I mean, my goodness, you know, it's a little bitty dinky town. And back then it was even much smaller. And we're like, why? Why do these people come there? And we think there's magic in the water there. We think it's in the water. We really do. And, um, and you know, that may sound flaky, but we believe what happened with the Native Americans in the Singing River, somehow set a karma in action that continued and still continues to this day that's music related because W.C. Handy, born in Florence, Alabama. Sam Phillips, okay, W.C. Handy, father of the blues, Florence, Alabama, born there. Sam Phillips, indisputably the father of rock and roll who discovered Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, all these people. Six miles down the road from W.C. Handy, he was born. They had the same influences. And so it just things got set in motion and it just kept, it kept happening and the momentum is there. And the momentum is there again, um, especially coming out of COVID, you know, because our poor musicians couldn't do live shows, you know, um, for so long. Even Jason Isbell, who uh, we just worked with him on his Shoals Fest in, in, uh, in Florence, Alabama, and it did our hearts good to see 6,000 people dancing to music by the singing river from our native son, Jason Isbell, because we had missed that. And we all felt like we were born again. We felt whole because it had been so long, you know. The, the musicians need to perform not just for money, but for their souls. Zoom performances and streaming don't cut it for them. They live for the eyes of the people in the audience and the feedback and the, you know, feeling the souls of the people and you just can't feel that digitally. So there's a lot of joy now that, you know, we are able, able to do that again. And now I'm going to shut up and see if any of you have questions you'd like to ask me. I do want to mention that um, you can see Tom's Wall, the wall we talked about. It's off the Natchez Trace, which is, of course, a national parkway. Starts in Nashville, ends in Natchez, Mississippi, or the other way around. Um, and it's right off of the parkway in Lauderdale County. So if you get a chance, you get down that way. Especially this time of year. It's very, yes, it's beautiful this time of year. It's a very you um, had a question? emotional kind of thing. Okay. Yes. Jerry Wexler. Jerry Wexler. Do you mind repeating he, the question? Yes. So we can have it Do what? Oh, okay. Yeah. He asked if the Swampers had a mentor. They most certainly did. Uh, it was Jerry Wexler. He 
was hanging out at Fame some, but he was hearing all these hits, you know, like Percy Sledge and and and, and he thought, I gotta go down there and see who that rhythm section is. And he just immediately fell in love with, with their style of music, the soulfulness of it, what they were doing. And so he kind of adopted them. I mean, I mean, Jerry Wexter performed our wedding ceremony. 35 years ago. I got ago, married on April Fool's which Day. Is which is the is only day David would marry me, and I know you'd have to bring that up. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, they were very close, and when they left Fame Recording Studios, which, you know, you see all that play out in, in the documentary, um, Jerry told them, he said, if you will build a studio across town, I will bring every big artist from Atlantic Records to work with y'all. That's how much I believe in y'all, and he did it. Starting with Cher and then on through that whole story. The first stream. hit we had was Take a Letter Maria. Uh, Arby Graves. Graves yeah. um, and they were so relieved because when they left fame, they were used to having hit records. And all of a sudden, here they are in their own studio. They've shelled out what little money they have to buy that glamorous building and uh, no hit for six months. And then so finally, you know, Take a Letter Maria. And then from there, it, Rolling you know. Stone. Yeah, they, they came right on the heels of that. Although we did not get a credit on rolling on the, that record. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson did. But because they were in a kind of a legal limbo in the U.S. and they weren't really yeah. supposed to stray they far from really Miami. The, the <laughs> they did that a lot. Yeah. To work. They had a visa to perform in the United States, but they didn't have a visa to work. So you won't see it on the album, but every time you see an interview with the yeah. Stones, they'll tell you how, you know, how much they enjoy recording those songs. In Muscle Shoals, and they would have come back, except that there was a little drug problem in Europe, and they couldn't cross the border. And so there you go. But um, does anybody else have a question? We hope they will come see us. I think there's some rack cards that will be available somewhere if you want to get one of those. Um, and we're open on our studio Tuesday through Saturday, and Fame Recording Studio is, is also open for tours, which is about three miles from us. And we're still very involved with them. Um, Rodney Hall is on our board of directors. And there's, of course, the Helen Keller birthplaces in our area. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed home. And we're, it took us, what, three hours to get here, I guess? Yeah. So it's not that far away. It's actually a beautiful drive today, it really too. Was. It was nice. So, uh, but we'll be happy to answer any other questions. I don't want to just sit here and bore you with, you know, blather. So <laughs> if y'all have got some. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just have a comment. Uh, I went to my niece's wedding in uh, Little Town hour outside of Krakow, Poland. Uh -huh. And in Poland, weddings are three days. Right. As it should be. About uh, 3 a.m. on the first day, the band plays Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> I love it. Uh, because I had a little bit of vodka and uh, I wasn't having vodka. Right. I went to and said, I'm from Alabama. And I talked about the university Football team, yeah. And I had to say American football. Right. And I tried to explain the, the uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, The guy I'm talking to really spoke English well, but it just didn't translate. Yeah. Didn't well, and it's and it's really um, because really in the beginning they were known as the Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section for a long time, and um, Denny Cordell, who was uh, Leon Russell's manager recorded with them uh had leon russell do a project with them and he had like two or three different rhythm sections on that project and so he had to differentiate them somehow and so he thought well these guys got kind of a groovy swampy sound i'm just going to call them the swampers and nobody thought a whole lot about it and that turned out to be a platinum record so it was on the studio wall and when the Leonard Skinner guys came busting in there to record, they saw that, and they saw the Swampers. And then years later, when they recorded the song Sweet Home Alabama, they appreciate what the Swampers believed in Leonard Skinner when nobody else did. Everybody else saw a bunch of rednecks from Florida. The Swampers were rednecks from Alabama, so they could identify with that. But also, they saw some very amazing talent. And Leonard Skinner band never forgot that so when they wrote the song sweet home alabama they put that that line in there as a tribute to their heroes and it really is uh and the night that they 
they called the studio to tell them they'd done it and they were recording. The Swampers were real busy back then. So Roger Hawkins answers the phone. And they go, hey, Roger, it's Ronnie from you know, Leonard Skinner. We've just recorded a song. We put a, a verse in there about y'all. And Ro Roger Hawkins, well, that's nice. That's really nice. Thank you for calling. And that's the, uh, that's the line that immortalized the Swampers. You know, that sample. But Roger was so busy that night, he was just going to say a polite thank you. The original version of Freebird was recorded with us. Yeah, um, the demo was recorded yeah. in our in our studio. On the, and we have the original piano that was recorded this on. It's one of the things requested most at bars where a lot of people are drunk. Freebird. Yeah. Feelings but I is the other. I think, um, especially after the documentary, that people got more clarity around, right, yeah. you know, who the Swampers were. Um, so, but it, it is so funny that they are, totally immortal immortalize them in that song because when david and i go to europe or somewhere it's like we'll go where are you from well they usually say what part of texas are you from well, that's what we hear i go well we're actually from alabama and they all say muscle shows and i mean people you'd be surprised i mean people go, oh yeah muscle shows got the swampers you know because that song is just so it's just part of the culture worldwide and it's crazy you hear it covered you know all over the world so uh, but that really is what immortalized him. I don't think Roger Hawkins realized that that night. But um, we've lost uh, David is the last remaining swamper. Uh, Roger Hawkins died in May of this year. The drummer Jimmy Johnson died two years ago, and Barry Beckett died in 2009. He was the keyboard player um, of cancer. And David, and David still performs. He was in fact in Birmingham. David was in Birmingham Thursday for, night. Yes, like a fool. Week. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, much to her dismay, he performed Because he just had shoulder replacement surgery, so it's my job to nag, you know, and, but he can't not play the bass. At I mean, 70 years old, he went on a world tour with Steve, uh, with uh, the, the, Water Boys. the Water Boys. And played like 116 shows on four continents in 17 countries. Again, like showing that you know but, it's never uh, too late to do. But that. I was kind of proud of him for that because I had friends in their fifties and sixties going, well, "I'm too old to do this." I'm like, "Well, David played a rock show in Norway last night. What did you do?" You know, my seventy-two-year-old husband. Because uh, I don't believe dreams have expiration dates. I don't think God put them there. You know, we put them there, and so I was really proud of David, really for doing that. It, it was physically very hard. It would have been hard on a man half his age. Uh, and those weren't easy shows. I mean, the Water Boys, that's rock. Very high energy. We went to um, Ireland. But, uh, and he's 78 now. He recently had the um, the shoulder replacement, but he played a show in Birmingham. Been on sessions recently. Uh, been on some sessions. But, he, you know, it'll be a gradual, you know, comeback. He doesn't think so. But I think after the show in Birmingham, he started to believe me a little bit that maybe – Let's take this. Songs. Let's he take played, a played two whole sets in Barber's Motorcycle Museum, which is why he went because of the stupid motorcycles. <laughs> I wanted to see the motorcycles. It's why he went, but because um, he loves, you know, Porsches and the whole thing down there. So, uh, but anyway, so he's still as active as you could expect a seventy-eight-year-old to be, and we are blessed that he is in excellent physical health, except for. The shoulder, and that's because he's a small man. He's been holding a heavy instrument every day for 60 years. You know, uh, it's just an occupational hazard. You know? Yeah. So, but thank you all for having us. Yeah, we appreciate it. It's a wonderful it. place Anybody to be. Anybody else has any questions, we'll answer them. Or, or uh, if not, like I said, we, we, had a, we had a rotary meeting Monday. One of our best friends spoke too long, and Debbie and I were like, you know, so we kind of got to give him the gong. I don't want to be that person where I look around and see him going, Well, they really going to show up. But but we are happy to be here. We thank y'all for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. We hope you'll come to Muscle Show. Thank thank you. You. So, Judy and Debbie, if we come to Muscle Shows, y'all will do our tour personally, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, thank y'all. Y'all did such a great job. And this is, I think it's the next day trip. So thank y'all. So interesting. Thank y'all so much for coming today. I want to tell you a couple of things. Um, please, we got Mr. Chris back there, First Bank of Alabama. We want to thank y'all so much for sponsoring Mr. Chris and uh, always doing that for us. And then the cookies, of course, Coosa Valley Medical Center, the Hickory Street Cafe. So sweet to always do the refreshments for us. I want to let you know next week we've got Mike Bunn coming in to do our program, and he's going to talk about the Gulf Coast 
uh, during the American Revolutionary War. And I think we get so caught up in thinking about the Gulf as vacation time. We don't think about the history of it. So Mike has been with us before. He does a great program. So we hope that you'll come back next week and see Mike. Today, as you get ready to leave, I want to tell you about something special that's happening across the hall. We occasionally have uh, local authors that want to self-sponsor their own program. So today we have that happening across the hall. Mr. Billy Coleman uh, from Sylacauga. A lot of people know Mr. Billy. Uh, he was the superintendent of the Coleman Schools for lots of years. He's moved back to Sylacauga, and he has a book called Call to Live. He is going to be across the hall in the high tower room from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock today signing copies of his book. So I wanted to let you know that that event was going on across the hall so that if you wanted to, you could stop by and say hello to him. Again, thank you all so much for being here today, and we'll see you next week.